Day eight, the first story of the Decameron. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. The Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio, translated by J. M. Rigg. Day eight, the first story. Gulfardo borrows monies of Guasparuolo, which he has agreed to give Guasparuolo's wife that he may lie with her. He gives them to her, and in her presence tells Guasparuolo that he has done so, and she acknowledges that tis true. Sith God has ordained that tis for me to take the lead to-day with my story, well pleased am I. And for that, loving ladies, much has been said touching the tricks that women play men, I am minded to tell you of one that a man played a woman, not because I would censure what the man did, or say that twas not merited by the woman, but rather to commend the man and censure the woman, and to show that men may beguile those that think to beguile them, as well as be beguiled by those they think to beguile. For peradventure what I am about to relate should, in strictness of speech, not be termed beguilement, but rather retaliation. For as it behoves woman to be most strictly virtuous, and to guard her chastity as her very life, nor on any account to allow herself to sully it, which, notwithstanding, tis not possible by reason of our frailty that there should be as perfect an observance of this law as were meet, I affirm that she that allows herself to infringe it for money merits the fire, whereas she that so offends under the prepotent stress of love will receive pardon from any judge that knows how to temper justice with mercy witness what but the other day we heard from Filostrato touching Madonna Filippa at Prato. Know then that there was once at Milan a German mercenary, Gulfardo by name, a doughty man, and very loyal to those with whom he took service, a quality most uncommon in Germans. And as he was wont to be most faithful in repaying whatever monies he borrowed, he would have no difficulty in finding a merchant to advance him any amount of money at a low rate of interest. Now, tarrying thus at Milan, Gulfado fixed his affection on a very fine woman, named Madonna Ambrogia, the wife of a wealthy merchant, Juan Guasparuolo Cagastraccio, with whom he was well acquainted and on friendly terms, which amour he managed with such discretion that neither the husband nor any one else wist aught of it. So one day he sent her a message, beseeching her of her courtesy to gratify his passion, and assuring her that he on his part was ready to obey her every behest. The lady made a great many words about the affair, the upshot of which was that she would do as Gulfado desired upon the following terms, to wit, that in the first place he should never discover the matter to a soul, and secondly, that as for some purpose or another she required two hundred florins of gold, he, out of his abundance, should supply her necessity. These conditions being satisfied, she would be ever at his service. Offended by such base sordidness in one whom he had supposed to be an honourable woman, Gulfardo passed from ardent love to something very like hatred, and cast about how he might flout her. So he sent her word that he would right gladly pleasure her in this and in any other matter that might be in his power. Let her but say when he was come to see her, and he would bring the monies with him, and none should know of the matter except a comrade of his, in whom he placed much trust, and who was privy to all that he did. The lady, if she should not rather be called the punk, gleefully made answer that in the course of a few days her husband, Guasparuolo, was to go to Genoa on business, and that when he was gone she would let Golfardo know, and appoint a time for him to visit her. Golfardo thereupon chose a convenient time, and hired him to Guasparuolo, to whom, I am come, quoth he, 
about a little matter of business which I have on hand, for which I require two hundred florins of gold, and I should be glad if thou wouldst lend them me at the rate of interest which thou art wont to charge me. That gladly will I, replied Guasparuolo, and told out the money at once. A few days later, Guasparuolo being gone to Genoa, as the lady had said, she sent word to Gulfardo that he should bring her the two hundred florins of gold. So Gulfardo hied him with his comrade to the lady's house, where he found her expecting him, and lost no time in handing her the two hundred florins of gold in his comrade's presence, saying, "'You will keep the money, madam, and give it to your husband when he returns.' Witting not why Gulfardo so said, but thinking that twas but to conceal from his comrade that it was given by way of price, the lady made answer, "'That will I gladly, but I must first see that the amount is right.' Whereupon she told the florins out upon a table, and when she found that the two hundred were there, she put them away in high glee, and turning to Gulfardo, took him into her chamber where, not on that night only, but on many another night, while her husband was away, he had of her all that he craved. On Guasparuolo's return, Gulfardo presently paid him a visit, having first made sure that the lady would be with him, and so in her presence. Guasparuolo, quoth he, I had, after all, no occasion for the money, to wit the two hundred florins of gold that thou didst lend me the other day, being unable to carry through the transaction for which I borrowed them, and so I took an early opportunity of bringing them to thy wife, and gave them to her. Thou wilt therefore cancel the account. Whereupon Guasparuolo turned to the lady, and asked her if she had them. She, not daring to deny the fact in presence of the witness, answered, "'Why, yes, I had them, and quite forgot to tell thee.' "'Good,' quoth then Guasparuolo, "'we are quits, Gulfardo. Make thy mind easy. I will see that thy account is set right.' Gulfardo then withdrew, leaving the flouted lady to hand over her ill-gotten gains to her husband, and so the astute lover had his pleasure of his greedy mistress for nothing.' End of Day 8, The First Story Recording by Ruth Golding Day 8, The Second Story of The Decameron This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Eugene Smith The Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio Translated by J. M. Rigg Day 8, The Second Story The priest of Valungo lies with Mona Belcolore. He leaves with her his cloak by way of pledge and receives from her a mortar. He returns the mortar and demands of her the cloak that he had left in pledge, which the good lady returns him with a jibe. Ladies and men alike commended Gualfardo for the check that he gave to the creed of the Milanese lady, but before they had done, the queen turned to Pamphilo, and with a smile bade him follow suit, wherefore thus Pamphilo began. Fair my ladies, it occurs to me to tell you a short story, which reflects no credit on those by whom we are continually wronged without being able to retaliate, to wit, the priests, who have instituted a crusade against our wives, and deem that, when they have made conquest of one of them, they have done a work every whit as worthy of recompense by remission of sin and punishment, as if they had brought the soldan in chains to Avignon. In which respect, "'Tis not possible for the hapless laity to be even with them. "'Howbeit, they are as hot to make reprisals on the priests' mothers, "'sisters, mistresses, and daughters, as the priests to attack their wives. "'Wherefore I am minded to give you, as I may do in few words, "'the history of a rustic amour, "'the conclusion whereof 
was not a little laughable, nor barren of moral, or you may also gather therefrom that tis not always well to believe everything that a priest says. I say then that at Varlungo, a village hard by here, as all of you, my ladies, should wot either of your own knowledge or by report, there dwelt a worthy priest, and doughty of body in the service of the ladies, who, albeit he was none too quick at his book, had no lack of precious and blessed solecisms to edify his flock with all of a Sunday under the elm. And when the men were out of doors, he would visit their wives as never a priest had done before him, bringing them feast-day gowns and holy water, and now again a bit of candle, and giving them his blessing. Now it so befell that among those of his fair parishioners whom he most affected, the first place was at length taken by one Mona Belcolore, the wife of a husbandman that called himself Ventivegna del Mazzo. And in good sooth, she was a winsome and lusty country lass, brown as a berry and buxom enough, and fitter than e'er another for his mill. Moreover, she had not her match in playing the tabret and singing. The borage is full sappy, and in leading a brawl or a breakdown, no matter who might be next her, with a fair and dainty kerchief in her hand, which spells so wrought upon Master Priest that for love of her he grew distracted, and did not all day long but loiter about the village on the chance of catching sight of her. And if of a Sunday morning he espied her in church, he strove might and main to acquit himself of his Kyrie and Sanctus in the style of a great singer, albeit his performance was liker to the braying of an ass. Whereas, if he saw her not, he scarce exerted himself at all. However, he managed with such discretion that neither Bentevegna del Mazzo nor any of the neighbors wist aught of his love. And hoping thereby to ingratiate himself with Mona Belcolore, he from time to time would send her presents, now a clove of fresh garlic, the best in all the countryside from his own garden, which he tilled with his own hands, and anon a basket of beans or a bunch of chives or shallots. And when he thought it might serve his turn, he would give her a sly glance, and follow it up with a little amorous mocking and mowing, which she, with rustic awkwardness, feigned not to understand, and ever maintained her reserve, so that Master Priest made no headway. Now it so befell that one day, when the priest at high noon was aimlessly gadding about the village, he encountered Bentevegna del Mazzo at the tail of a well-laden ass, and greeted him, asking him whither he was going. "'If faith, sir,' quoth Bentevegna, "'for sure tis to town I go, having an affair or two to attend to there, and I'm taking these things to Ser Bonacore de Ginestretto, to get him to stand by me, and I wot not what matter, whereof the justice of the quorum has by his provoker served me with a pertrumpery summons to appear before him. Whereupon, "'Tis well, my son,' quoth the priest, overjoyed, "'my blessing go with thee. Good luck to thee, and a speedy return. And hark ye, shouldst thou see Lapuccio or Naldino, do not forget to tell them to send me those thongs for my flails.' "'It shall be done,' quoth Pentevegna, and jogged on towards Florence, while the priest, thinking that now was his time to hie him to Belcolore and try his fortune, put his best leg forward, and stayed not till he was at the house, which entering, he said, "'God be gracious to us, who is within?' Belcolore, who was up in the loft, made answer, "'Welcome, sir, but what dost thou gadding about in the heat?' why as i hope for god's blessing quoth he i am just come to stay with thee for a while having met thy husband on his way to town whereupon down came bel colore took a seat and began sifting cabbage seed that her husband had lately threshed by and by the priest began so bel colore wilt thou keep me ever a dying thus whereat bel colore tittered and said why what's it i do to you Truly, nothing at all, replied the priest, but thou sufferest me not to do to thee that which I had lief, 
and which God commands. No, away with you, returned Belcore. Do priests do that sort of thing? Indeed we do, quoth the priest, and to better purpose than others. Why not? I tell you our grinding is far better. And wouldst thou know why? Tis because tis intermittent. And in truth, twill be well worth thy while to keep thine own counsel, and let me do it. Worth my while? ejaculated Belcolore. How may that be? There is never a one of you but would overreach the very devil. Tis not for me to say, returned the priest. Say but what thou wouldst have. Shall it be a pair of dainty shoes, or wouldst thou prefer a fillet? Or perchance a gay ribbon? What's thy will? Marry, no lack have I, quoth Belcolore, of such things as these. But if you wish me so well, why do me not a service? and I would then be at your command. Name but the service, returned the priest, and gladly will I do it. Quoth then Belcolore, On Saturday I have to go to Florence to deliver some wool that I have spun, and to get my spinning wheel put in order. Lend me but five pounds, I know you have them, and I will redeem my purse petticoat from the pawn shop, and also the girdle that I wear on saints' days, and that I had when I was married. You see that without them I cannot go to church or anywhere else, and then I will do just as you wish, thenceforth and forever. Whereupon, So God give me a good year, quoth he, as I have not the money with me, but never fear that I will see that thou hast it before Saturday with all the pleasure in life. Ay, ay, rejoined Belcolore, you all make great promises, but then you never keep them. Think you to serve me as you serve Biliuzza, whom you left in the lurch at last? God's faith, you do not so. To think that she turned woman of the world just for that. If you have not the money with you, why, go and get it. Prithee, returned the priest, send me not home just now, for seest thou, tis the very nick of time with me, and the coast is clear, and perchance it might not be so on my return and in short I know not when it would be likely to go so well as now. Whereto she did but rejoin, Good, if you are minded to go, get you gone. If not, stay where you are. The priest, therefore, seeing that she was not disposed to give him what he wanted, as he was fain, to wit, on his own terms, but was bent on having a quid pro quo, changed his tone, and... Lo now, quoth he, thou doubtest I will not bring thee the money, so to set thy mind at rest, I will leave thee this cloak, thou seest tis good sky-blue silk, in pledge. So raising her head and glancing at the cloak, And what may the cloak be worth? quoth Belcolore. Worth? ejaculated the priest. I would have thee know that tis all do I, not to say true I, make. Nay, there are some of our folk, here that say, tis quadruai, and tis not a fortnight since I bought it of Lotto, the second-hand dealer, for seven good pounds, and then had it five good sold I under value, by what I hear from Buglietto, who, thou knowest, is an excellent judge of these articles. Oh, say you so, exclaimed Belcore, so help me God, I should not have thought it. However, let me look at it. So Master Priest, being ready for action, doffed the cloak and handed it to her. And she, having put it in a safe place, said to him, Now, sir, we will away to the hut. There is never a soul goes there. And so they did. And there Master Priest, giving her many a mighty bus and straining her to his sacred person, solaced himself with her no little while. Which done he hied him away in his cassock, as if he were come from officiating at a wedding. But when he was back in his holy quarters, he bethought him that not all the candles that he received by way of offering in the course of an entire year would amount to half of five pounds, and saw that he had made a bad bargain, and repented him that he had left the cloak in pledge, and cast about how he might recover it without paying anything. And as he did not lack cunning, he hit upon an excellent expedient, by which he compassed his end. So, on the morrow, being a saint's day, he sent a neighbor's lad to Monobelcolore. 
with a request that she would be so good as to lend him her stone mortar for that Binguccio del poggio and luto buglietti were to breakfast with him that morning and he therefore wished to make a sauce belcolore having sent the mortar the priest about breakfast time reckoning that bentivegna del mazzo and belcolore would be at their meal called his clerk and said to him take the mortar back to belcolore and say my master thanks you very kindly and bids you return the cloak that the lad left with you in pledge the clerk took the mortar to belcolore's house where finding her at table with bentivegna he set the mortar down and delivered the priest's message whereto belcolore would fain have demurred but bentivegna gave her a threatening glance saying so then thou takest a pledge from master priest by christ i vow i have half a mind to give thee a great clout of the chin go give it back at once or murrain on thee and look to it that whatever he may have a mind to were it our very ass he be never denied so with a very bad grace belcolore got up and went to the wardrobe and took out the cloak and gave it to the clerk saying tell thy master from me would to god he may never ply pestle in my mortar again such honour has he done me for this turn so the clerk returned with the cloak and delivered the message to master priest who laughing made answer tell her when thou next seest her that so she lend us not the mortar i will not lend her the pestle be it tit for tat bentivegna made no account of his wife's words deeming that twas but his chiding that had provoked them but belcolore was not a little displeased with master priest and had never a word to say to him till the vintage after which what with the salutary fear in which she stood of the mouth of lucifer the great to which he threatened to consign her and the must and roast chestnuts that he sent her she made it up with him and many a jolly time they had together and though she got not the five pounds from him he put a new skin on her tabret and fitted it with a little bell wherewith she was satisfied end of day eight the second story day eight the third story of the decameron this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the decameron by giovanni boccaccio translated by j m rigg day eight the third story calandrino bruno and Bufalmacco go in quest of the heliotrope beside the Mugnone. Thinking to have found it, Calandrino gets him home laden with stones. His wife chides him, whereat he waxes froth, beats her, and tells his comrades what they know better than he. Ended Pamphilo's story, which moved the ladies to inextinguishable laughter. The queen bade Elisa follow suit, Whereupon, laughing, she thus began. I know not, debonair my ladies, whether with my little story, which is no less true than entertaining, I shall give you occasion to laugh as much as Panfilo has done with his, but I will do my best. In our city, where there has never been lack of odd humours and queer folk, there dwelt, not long time ago, a painter named Calandrino, a simple soul of uncouth manners that spent most of his time with two other painters the one bruno the other buffalmacco by name pleasant fellows enough but not without their full share of sound and shrewd sense and who kept with calandrino for that they not seldom found his singular ways and his simplicity very diverting there was also at the same time at florence one Maso del Saggio, a fellow marvellously entertaining by his cleverness, dexterity, and unfailing resource, who, having heard somewhat touching Calandrino's simplicity, resolved to make fun of him by playing him a trick, and inducing him to believe some prodigy. 
and happening one day to come upon calandrino in the church of san giovanni where he sat intently regarding the paintings and intaglios of the tabernacle above the altar which had then but lately been set there he deemed time and place convenient for the execution of his design which he accordingly imparted to one of his comrades whereupon the two men drew nigh the place where calandrino sat alone and feigning not to see him fell a-talking of the virtues of diverse stones of which mazo spoke as aptly and pertinently as if he had been a great and learned lapidary calandrino heard what passed between them and witting that was no secret after a while got up and joined them to maso's no small delight he therefore continued his discourse and being asked by calandrino where these stones of such rare virtues were to be found made answer chiefly in berlinzone in the land of the basques the district is called bengodi and there they bind the vines with sausages and a denier will buy a goose and a gosling into the bargain and on a mountain all of grated parmesan cheese dwell folk that do not else but make macaroni and ravioli and boil them in capon's broth and then throw them down to be scrambled for and hard by flows a rivulet of vernaccia the best that ever was drunk and never a drop of water therein ah tis a sweet country quoth calandrino but tell me what becomes of the capons that they boil they are all eaten by the basques replied maso then what's thou ever there quoth calandrino whereupon was i ever there sayst thou replied maso why if i have been there once i have been there a thousand times and how many miles is it from here quoth calandrino oh returned maso more than thou couldst number in a night without slumber farther off than than the abruzzi said calandrino why yes tis a bit farther replied maso now calandrino like the simple soul that he was marking the composed and grave countenance with which maso spoke could not have believed him more thoroughly if he had uttered the most patent truth and thus taking his words for gospel tis a trifle too far for my purse quoth he were it nigher i warrant thee i would go with thee thither one while just to see the macaroni come tumbling down and take my fill thereof but tell me so good luck befall thee are none of these stones that have these rare virtues to be found in these regions eh replied maso two sorts of stone are found there both of virtues extraordinary the one sort are the sandstones of settignano and montici which being made into millstones by virtue thereof flour is made wherefore it is a common saying in those countries that blessings come from god and millstones from montici but for that these sandstones are in great plenty they are held cheap by us just as by them are emeralds whereof they have mountains bigger than monte morello that shine at midnight a god's name and know this that whoso should make a goodly pair of millstones and connect them with a ring before ever a hole was drilled in them then take them to the soldan should get all he would have thereby the other sort of stone is the heliotrope as we lapidaries call it a stone of very great virtue inasmuch as whoso carries it on his person is seen so long as he keep it by never another soul where he is not these be virtues great indeed quoth calandrino but where is the second stone to be found where tomaso made answer that there were usually some to be found in mugnone and what are its size and colour quoth calandrino the size varies replied maso for some are bigger and some smaller than others but all are of the same colour being nearly black 
all these matters duly marked and fixed in his memory calandrino made as if he had other things to attend to and took his leave of maso with the intention of going in quest of the stone but not until he had let his especial friends bruno and buffalmacco know of his project so that no time might be lost but postponing everything else they might begin the quest at once he set about looking for them and spent the whole morning in the search at length when it was already past none he called to mind that they would be at work in the fantine women's convent and though it was excessively hot he let nothing stand in his way but at a pace that was more like a run than a walk he'd him thither and so soon as he had made them aware of his presence thus he spoke comrades so you are but minded to hearken to me tis in our power to become the richest men in florence for i am informed by one that may be trusted that there is a kind of stone in the mugnone which renders whoso carries it invisible to every other soul in the world wherefore methinks we were wise to let none have the start of us but go search for the stone without any delay we shall find it without a doubt for i know what tis like and when we have found it we have but to put it in the purse and get us to the money-changers whose counters as you know are always laden with groats and florins and help ourselves to as many as we have a mind to no one will see us and so hey presto we shall be rich folk in the twinkling of an eye and have no more need to go besmearing the walls all day long like so many snails whereat bruno and buffalmacco began only to laugh and exchanging glances made as if they marvelled exceedingly and expressed approval of calandrino's project then buffalmacco asked what might be the name of the stone calandrino like the numbskull that he was had already forgotten the name so he made answer why need we concern ourselves with the name since we know the stone's virtue methinks we were best to go look for it and waste no more time well well said bruno but what are the size and shape of the stone they are of all sizes and shapes said calandrino but they are all pretty nearly black wherefore methinks we were best to collect all the black stones that we see until we hit upon it and so let us be off and lose no more time nay but said bruno wait a bit and turning to buffalmacco methinks quoth he that calandrino says well but i doubt this is not the time for such work seeing that the sun is high and his rays so flood the mugnone as to dry all the stones insomuch that stones will now show as white that in the morning before the sun had dried them would show as black besides which to-day being a working day there will be for one cause or another folk not a few about the mugnone who seeing us might guess what we were come for and peradventure do the like themselves whereby it might well be that they found the stone and we might miss the trot by trying after the amble wherefore so you agree methinks we were best to go about it in the morning when we shall be better able to distinguish the black stones from the white and on a holiday when there will be none to see us buffalmacco's advice being approved by bruno calandrino chimed in and so twas arranged that they should all three go in quest of the stone on the following sunday so calandrino having besought his companions above all things to let never a soul in the world hear aught of the matter for that it had been imparted to him in strict confidence and having told them what he had heard touching the land of bengodi the truth of which he affirmed with oaths took leave of them and they concerted their plan while calandrino impatiently expected the sunday morning whereon about dawn he arose and called them and forth they issued by the porta a san gallo and hied them to the mugnone and following its course began their quest of the stone 
calandrino as was natural leading the way and jumping lightly from rock to rock and wherever he espied a black stone stooping down picking it up and putting it in the fold of his tunic while his comrades followed picking up a stone here and a stone there thus it was that calandrino had not gone far before finding that there was no more room in his tunic he lifted the skirts of his gown which was not cut after the fashion of enot and gathering them under his leathern girdle and making them fast on every side thus furnished himself with a fresh and capacious lap which however taking no time to fill he made another lap out of his cloak which in like manner he soon filled with stones wherefore bruno and buffalmacco seeing that calandrino was well laden and that twas nigh upon breakfast time and the moment for action come where is calandrino quoth bruno to buffalmacco where to buffalmacco who had calandrino full in view having first turned about and looked here there and everywhere made answer that what not i but not so long ago he was just in front of us not so long ago forsooth returned bruno tis my firm belief that at this very moment he is at breakfast at home having left to us his wild goose chase of black stones in the munione merry quoth buffalmacco he did but serve us right so to trick us and leave seeing that we were so silly as to believe him why who could have thought that any but we would have been so foolish as to believe that a stone of such rare virtue was to be found in the munione calandrino hearing their colloquy forthwith imagined that he had the stone in his hand and by its virtue though present was invisible to them and overjoyed by such good fortune would not say a word to undeceive them but determined to hie him home and accordingly faced about and put himself in motion whereupon eh quoth buffalmacco to bruno what are we about that we go not back to go we then said bruno but by god i swear that calandrino shall never play me another such trick and as to this where i nigh him as i have been all the morning i would teach him to remember it for a month or so such a reminder would i give him in the heel with this stone and even as he spoke he threw back his arm and launched the stone against calandrino's heel galled by the blow calandrino gave a great hop and a slight gasp but said nothing and halted not then picking out one of the stones that he had collected bruno quoth buffalmacco see what a goodly stone i have here would it might but catch calandrino in the back and forthwith he discharged it with main force upon the said back and in short suiting action to word now in this way now in that they stoned him all the way up the munione as far as the porta a san gallo there they threw away the stones they had picked up and tarried a while with the customs officers who being primed by them had let calandrino pass unchallenged while their laughter knew no bounds so calandrino halting nowhere betook him to his house which was hard by the corner of the massina and so well did fortune prosper the trick that all the way by the stream and across the city there was never a soul that said a word to calandrino and indeed he encountered but few for most folk were at breakfast but no sooner was calandrino thus gotten home with his stones than it so happened that his good lady monna tessa showed her fair face at the stair's head and catching sight of him and being somewhat annoyed by his long delay chid him saying what the devil brings thee here so late must breakfast wait thee until all other folk have had it calandrino caught the words and angered and mortified to find that he was not invisible broke out with alas cursed woman so twas thou thou hast undone me but god's faith i will pay thee out whereupon he was upstairs in a trice and having discharged his great load of stones in a parlour 
rushed with fell intent upon his wife and laid hold of her by the hair and threw her down at his feet and beat and kicked her in every part of her person with all the force he had in his arms and legs insomuch that he left never a hair of her head or bone of her body unscathed and twas all in vain that she laid her palms together and crossed her fingers and cried for mercy now Bufalmacco and Bruno, after making merry a while with the warders of the gate, had set off again at a leisurely pace, keeping some distance behind Calandrino. Arrived at his door, they heard the noise of the sound thrashing that he was giving his wife, and making as if they were but that very instant come upon the scene, they called him. Calandrino, flushed all off a sweat and out of breath, showed himself at the window and bade them come up they putting on a somewhat angry air did so and espied calandrino sitting in the parlour amid the stones which lay all about untrussed and puffing with the air of a man spent with exertion while his lady lay in one of the corners weeping bitterly her hair all dishevelled her clothes torn to shreds and her face livid bruised and battered so after surveying the room a while what means this calandrino quoth they art thou minded to build thee a wall that we see so many stones about and then as they received no answer they continued and how's this how comes mona tessa in this plight twould seem thou hast given her a beating what unheard of doings are these what with the weight of the stones that he had carried and the fury with which he had beaten his wife and the mortification that he felt at the miscarriage of his enterprise calandrino was too spent to utter a word by way of reply wherefore in a menacing tone buffalmacco began again however out of sorts thou mayst have been calandrino thou shouldst not have played us so scurvy a trick as thou hast to take us with thee to the Munione in quest of this stone of rare virtue, and then, without so much as saying either good speed or devil speed, to be off, and leave us there like a couple of gogs, we take it not a little unkindly, and rest assured that thou shalt never so fool us again. Whereto, with an effort, Calandrino replied, Comrades, be not wroth with me, tis not as you think. I, luckless right, found the stone listen and you will no longer doubt that i say sooth when you began saying one to another where is calandrino i was within ten paces of you and marking that you came by without seeing me i went before and so keeping ever a little ahead of you i came hither and then he told them the whole story of what they had said and done from beginning to end and showed them his back and heel how they had been mauled by the stones after which and i tell you he went on that laden though i was with all these stones that you see here never a word was said to me by the warders of the gate as i passed in though you know how vexatious and grievous these warders are wont to make themselves in their determination to see everything and moreover i met by the way several of my gossips and friends that are ever wont to greet me and ask me to drink and never a word said any or them to me no nor half a word either but they passed me by as men that saw me not but at last being come home i was met and seen by this devil of a woman curses upon her for as much as all things as you know lose their virtue in the presence of a woman whereby i from being the most lucky am become the most luckless man in florence and therefore i thrashed her as long as i could stir a hand nor now i wherefore i forbear to slice her veins for her cursed be the hour that first i saw her cursed be the hour that i brought her into the house and so kindling with fresh wrath he was about to start up and give her another thrashing when buffalmacco and bruno who had listened to his story with an air of great surprise and affirmed its truth again and again while 
they all but burst with suppressed laughter seeing him now frantic to renew his assault upon his wife got up and withstood and held him back averring that the lady was in no wise to blame for what had happened but only he who witting that things lost their virtue in the presence of women had not bidden her keep aloof from him that day which precaution god had not suffered him to take either because the luck was not to be his or because he was minded to cheat his comrades to whom he should have shown the stone as soon as he found it and so with many words they hardly prevailed upon him to forgive his injured wife and leaving him to rue the ill luck that had filled his house with stones went their way End of Day 8 The Third Story Day 8 The Fourth Story of the Decameron This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon The Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio Translated by J. M. Rigg Day 8 The Fourth Story the rector of Fiesole loves a widow lady, by whom he is not loved, and thinking to lie with her, lies with her maid, with whom the lady's brothers cause him to be found by his bishop. Elisa being come to the end of her story, which in the telling had yielded no small delight to all the company, the queen, turning to Emilia, signified her will that her story should ensue at once upon that of Elisa. And thus with alacrity, Emilia began. Noble ladies, how we are teased and tormented by these priests and friars, and indeed by clergy of all sorts, I might need to have been set forth in more than one of the stories that have been told, but as it were not possible to say so much thereof, but that more would yet remain to say, I propose to supplement them with the story of a rector, who, in defiance of all the world, was bent upon having the favour of a gentlewoman, whether she would or no which gentlewoman, being discreet above a little, treated him as he deserved. Fiesole, whose hill is here within sight, is, as each of you knows, a city of immense antiquity, and was aforetime great, though now it is fallen into complete decay, which, notwithstanding, it always was, and still is, the see of a bishop. Now there was once a gentlewoman, Mona Picarda by name, a widow, that had an estate at Fiesole, hard by the cathedral, on which, for that she was not in the easiest circumstances, she lived most part of the year, and with her her two brothers, very worthy and courteous young men, both of them. And the lady, being wont frequently to resort to the cathedral, and being still quite young, and fair, and debonair withal, it so befell that the rector grew in the last degree enamoured of her, and waxed at length so bold, that he himself avowed his passion to the lady, praying her to entertain his love, and requite it in like measure. The rector was advanced in years, but otherwise the veriest springold, being bold and of a high spirit, of a boundless conceit of himself, and of a mien and manners most affected, and in the worst taste, and withal so tiresome and insufferable, that he was on bad terms with everybody, and, if with one person more than another, with this lady, who not only cared not a jot for him, but had liefer have had a headache, than his company. Wherefore the lady discreetly made answer, I may well prize your love, sir, and love you I should and will right gladly, but such love as yours and mine may never admit of aught that is not honourable. You are my spiritual father and a priest, and now verging towards old age, circumstances which should ensure your honour and chastity, and I, on my part, am no longer a girl, such as these love affairs might be seen, but a widow, and well you wot how it behoves widows to be chaste. Wherefore I pray you to have me excused, for, after the sort you crave, you shall never have my love, nor would I in such sort be loved by you. With this answer the rector was for the nonce fain to be content, but he was not the man to be dismayed and routed by a first repulse, and with his wonted temerity and effrontery he plied her again and again with letters and embassages, and also by word of mouth, when he espied her entering the church. Wherefore the lady, finding this persecution more grievous and harassing than she could well bear, cast about how she might be quit thereof in such fashion as he deserved, seeing that he left her no choice, howbeit she would do naught in the matter until she had conferred with her brothers. 
She therefore told them how the rector pursued her, and how she meant to foil him, and, with their full concurrence, some few days afterwards she went, as she was wont, to church. The rector no sooner saw her than he approached and accosted her, as he was wont, in a tone of easy familiarity. The lady greeted him as he came up with a glance of gladsome recognition, and when he had treated her to not a little of his wonted eloquence, she drew him aside, and heaving a great sigh, said, "'I have oftentimes heard it said, sir, that there is no castle so strong, but that, if the siege be continued day by day, it will sooner or later be taken, which I now plainly perceive is my own case. For so fairly have you hemmed me in with this, that, and the other pretty speech or the like blandishments, that you have constrained me to make naught of my former resolve.' and seeing that i find such favour with you to surrender myself unto you whereto overjoyed the rector made answer madam i am greatly honoured and sooth to say i marvelled not a little how you should hold out so long seeing that i have never had the like experience with any other woman insomuch that i have at times said were women of silver they would not be worth a denier for there is none but would give under the hammer but no more of this when and where may we come together? Sweet my lord, replied the lady. For the when, tis just as we may think best, for I have no husband to whom to render account of my knights, but the where passes my wit to conjecture. How so? quoth the rector. Why not in your own house? Sir, replied the lady, you know that I have two brothers, both young men, who day and night bring their comrades into the house, which is none too large for which reason it might not be done there, unless we were minded to make ourselves, as it were, dumb and blind, uttering never a word, not so much as a monosyllable, and abiding in the dark. In such sort, indeed, it might be, because they do not intrude upon my chamber. But theirs is so near to mine, that the very least whisper could not but be heard. "'Nay, but, madam,' returned the rector, "'let not this stand in our way for a night or two, until I may bethink me where else we might be more at our ease.' "'Be that as you will, sir,' quoth the lady. "'I do but entreat that the affair be kept close, "'so that never a word of it get wind.' "'Have no fear on that score, madam,' replied the priest. "'And if so it may be, let us forgather to-night.' "'With pleasure,' returned the lady. "'And, having appointed him how and when to come, "'she left him and went home. "'Now the lady had a maid that was none too young, and had a countenance the ugliest and most misshapen that ever was seen. For, indeed, she was flat-nosed, wry-mouthed, and thick-lipped, with huge, ill-set teeth, eyes that squinted and were ever blurred, and a complexion betwixt green and yellow, that showed as if she had spent the summer not at Fiesole, but at Sinigaglia. Besides which, she was hip-shot and somewhat halting on the right side, her name was Kiuta, but, for that she was such a scurvy bitch to look upon, she was called by all folk Chutatze, and being thus misshapen of body, she was also not without her share of guile. So the lady called her, and said, Chutatze, so thou wilt do me a service to-night, I will give thee a fine new shift. At the mention of the shift, Chutatze made answer, So you give me a shift, madam, I will throw myself into the very fire. Good, said the lady. Then I would have thee lie to-night in my bed with a man, whom thou wilt caress. But look, thou say never a word, that my brothers, who, as thou knowest, sleep in the next room, hear thee not, and afterwards I will give thee the shift. Sleep with a man? quoth Chutatza. Why, if need be, I will sleep with six. So in the evening Master Rector came, as he had been bidden, and the two young men, as the lady had arranged, being in their room, and making themselves very audible, he stole noiselessly and in the dark into the lady's room, and got him on to the bed, which Chutatza, well advised by the lady how to behave, mounted from the other side. Whereupon Master Rector, thinking to have the lady by his side, took Chutatza in his arms, and fell a-kissing her, saying never a word the while, and Chutatza did the like, and so he enjoyed her, plucking the boon which he had so long desired. The rector and Chutatza thus closeted, the lady charged her brothers to execute the rest of her plan. They accordingly stole quietly out of their room, and hied them to the piazza, where fortune proved propitious beyond what they had craved of her, for, it being a very hot night, the bishop had been seeking them, purposing to go home with them, and solace himself with their society, and quench his thirst. 
with which desire he acquainted them as soon as he espied them coming into the piazza and so they escorted him to their house and there in the cool of their little courtyard which was bright with many a lamp he took to his no small comfort a draught of their good wine which done sir said the young man since of your great courtesy you have deigned to visit our poor house to which we were but now about to invite you we should be gratified if you would be pleased to give a look at somewhat a mere trifle though it be which we have here to show you the bishop replied that he would do so with pleasure whereupon one of the young men took a lighted torch and led the way the bishop and the rest following to the chamber where master rector lay with chutatza now the rector being in hot haste had ridden hard insomuch that he was already gotten above three miles on his way when they arrived and so being somewhat tired he was resting but hot though the night was he still held chutatza in his arms in which posture he was shown to the bishop when preceded by the young man bearing the light and followed by the others he entered the chamber and being roused and observing the light and the folk that stood about him master rector was mighty ashamed and affrighted and popped his head under the clothes but the bishop reprimanding him severely constrained him to thrust his head out again and take a view of his bedfellow thus made aware of the trick which the lady had played him the rector was now both on that score and by reason of his signal disgrace the saddest man that ever was and his discomfiture was complete when having donned his clothes he was committed by the bishop's command to close custody and sent to prison there to expiate his offence by a rigorous penance the bishop was then fain to know how it had come about that he had foregathered there with chutatza whereupon the young man related the whole story which ended the bishop commanded both the lady and the young man not a little for that they had taken condign vengeance upon him without imbruing their hands in the blood of a priest the bishop caused him to bewail his transgression forty days but what with his love and the scornful requital which it had received he bewailed it more than forty and nine days not to mention that for a great while he could not show himself in the street but the boys would point the finger at him and say there goes he that lay with chitatza which was such an affliction to him that he was like to go mad on this wise the worthy lady rid herself of the rector's vexatious importunity and chitatza had a jolly night and earned her shift End of Day 8, The Fourth Story Day 8, The Fifth Story of The Decameron This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio Translated by J. M. Rigg Day 8. The Fifth Story Three young men pull down the breeches of a judge from the marshes, while he is administering justice on the bench. So ended Emilia her story, and when all had commended the widow lady, "'Tis now thy turn to speak," quoth the queen, fixing her gaze upon Philostrato, who answered that he was ready, and forthwith thus began. Sweet, my ladies, by what I remember of that young man, to wit, Maso de Sagio, whom Elisa named a while ago, I am prompted to lay aside a story which I had meant to tell you, and to tell you another, touching him and some of his comrades, which, notwithstanding, there are in it certain words, albeit tis not unseemly, which your modesty forbears to use, is yet so laughable that I shall relate it. As you may well have heard, there come not seldom to our city magistrates from the marches, who for the most part are men of a mean spirit, and in circumstances so reduced and beggarly, that their whole life seems to be but a petty foggery, and by reason of this their inbred sordidness and avarice they bring with them judges and notaries that have rather the air of men taken from the plough, or the last than trained in the schools of law. Now one of these marchers, being come hither as Podesta, brought with him judges not a few, and among them one that called himself Monsieur Nicola de San Lepido, who looked like to a locksmith than aught else. However, this fellow was assigned with the rest of the judges to hear criminal cases, and as folks will go often to court, though they have no concern whatever there, it so befell that Maso de Sagio went thither one morning in quest of one of his friends, and there chancing to set eyes on this Messer Nicola, 
where he sate, deemed him a fowl of no common feather, and surveyed him from head to foot, observing that the vair which he wore on his head was all begrimed, that he carried an inkhorn from his girdle, and that his gown was longer than his robe, and many another detail quite foreign to the appearance of a man of birth and breeding, of which that which he deemed most notable was a pair of breeches, which, as he saw, for the judge's outer garments being none too ample, were open in front while he sate, reached halfway down his legs, by which his mind was presently diverted from the friend whom he had come there to seek, and forth he hied him in quest of other two of his comrades, the one Ribby, the other Matuzio by name, fellows both of them not a whit less jolly than Maso himself, and having found them, he said to them, As you love me, come with me to the court, and I will show you the queerest scarecrow that you ever saw. So the two men hied with him to the court, and there he pointed to the dais on which the master judge was seated, and there he pointed out to them the judge and his breeches. What they saw from a distance served to set them laughing. Then, drawing nearer to the dais, on which the master judge was seated, they observed that twas easy enough to get under the dais, and, moreover, that the plank on which the judge's feet rested was broken, so that there was plenty of room for the passage of a hand and an arm. Whereupon, quoth Maso to his comrades, "'Twere a very easy manner to pull these breeches right down. Wherefore, I propose that we do so. Each of the men had marked how it might be done, and so, having concerted both what they should do and what they should say, they came to the court again next morning, and the court being crowded, Mateuzo, observed by never a soul, slipped beneath the dais and posted himself right under the spot where the judge's feet rested, while the other two men took their stand on either side of the judge, each laying hold of the hem of his robe. Then, Sir! Sir, I pray you, for God's sake, began Maso, that, before the pilfering rascal that is there beside you can make off, you constrain him to give me back a pair of jackboots that he has stolen from me, which theft he still denies, though twas not a month since I saw him getting them resold. Meanwhile, Ribby, at the top of his voice, shouted, Believe him not, sir, the scurvy knave. Tis but that he knows that I am come to demand restitution of a valise which he has stolen from me that he now for the first time trumps up this story about a pair of jackboots that I have had in my house down to the last day or two, and if you doubt what I say, I can bring as witness Treka, my neighbor, and Grassa, the tripe woman, and the one that goes about gathering the sweepings of Santa Maria Avrezaria, who saw him when he was on his way back from the farm. But, shout as he might, Mazo was still even with him, nor for all that did Ribby bait a jot of his clamor. And while the judge stood, bending now towards the one, now towards the other, the better to hear them, Mateuzo seized his opportunity, and thrusting his hand through the hole in the plank, caught hold of the judge's breeches and tugged at them amain. Whereby, down they came straight away, for the judge was a lean man, and shrunk in the buttocks. The judge, being aware of the accident, but knowing not how it came about, would have gathered his outer garments together in front, so as to cover the defect. But Maso on the one side, and Ribby on the other, held him fast, shouting amain, and in chorus, You do me a grievous wrong, sir, thus to deny me justice, nay, even a hearing. And, to think of quitting the court, there needs no writ in this city for such a trifling a matter as this. And thus they held him, by the clothes, and in parley, until all that were in the court perceived that he has lost his breeches. However, after a while, Mateuzo dropped the breeches, and slipped off and out of the court without being observed. And Ribby, deeming that the joke had gone far enough, exclaimed, By God, I vow, I will appear to the syndics. While Maso, on the other hand, let go of the robe, saying, Nay, but for my part, I will come here again, and again, and again, unless I find you less embarrassed than you seem to be today. And so the one this way, the other that way, they made off with all speed. Whereupon, Master Judge, Disbreached before all the world, was as one that awakens from sleep, albeit he is aware of his forlorn condition, and asks whither the parties in the case touching the jackboots and the valise were gone. However, as they could not be found, he fell a swearing by the bowels of God 
that twas meet and proper that he should know and wit whether twas the custom at florence to disbreach judges sitting in the seat of justice when the affair reached the ears of the podesta he made no little stir about it but being informed by some of his friends that twould not have happened but that the florentines were minded to show him that in the place of the judges he should have brought with him he had brought but gawks to save expense he deemed it the best way to say no more about it and so for that the matter went no further end of day eight the fifth story day eight the sixth story of the decameron this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. C. Guan. The Decameron by Giovanni Boccaccio. Translated by J. M. Rigg. Day 8. The Sixth Story. Bruno and Buffalmaco steal a pig from Calandrino, and induce him to essay its recovery by means of pills of ginger and vernaccia. Of the said pills they give him two, one after the other, made of dog ginger compounded with aloes and it then appearing as if he had had the pig himself, they constrained him to buy them off, if he would not have them tell his wife. Philostrato's story, which elicited not a little laughter, was no sooner ended, than the queen bade Philomena follow suit. Wherefore, thus Philomena began. As gracious ladies, t'was the name of Maso del Saggio that prompted Philostrato to tell the story that you have but now heard, even so, Tis with me in regard of Calandrino and his comrades, of whom I am minded to tell you another story, which you will, I think, find entertaining. Who Calandrino, Bruno, and Buffalmaco were, I need not explain. You know them well enough from the former story, and, therefore, I will tarry no longer than to say that Calandrino had a little estate not far from Florence, which his wife had brought him by way of dowry and which yielded them yearly, among other matters, a pig, and t'was his custom every year in the month of December to resort to the farm with his wife, there to see the killing and salting of the said pig. Now, one of these years, it so happened that his wife being unwell, Calandrino went thither alone to kill the pig, and Bruno and Buffalmaco, learning that he was gone to the farm, and that his wife was not with him, betook them to the house of a priest that was their especial friend and a neighbor of Calandrino, there to tarry a while. Upon their arrival, Calandrino, who had that very morning killed the pig, met them with the priest and accosted them, saying, A hearty welcome to you. I should like you to see what an excellent manager I am. And so he took them into his house and showed them the pig. They observed that was a very fine pig, and learned from Calandrino that he was minded to salt it for household consumption. Then thou art but a fool, quoth Bruno. Sell it, man, and let us have a jolly time with the money, and tell thy wife that was stolen. Not I, replied Calandrino. She would never believe me, and would drive me out of the house. Urge me no further, for I will never do it. The others said a great deal more, but to no purpose, and Calandrino bade them to supper, but so coldly that they declined and left him. Presently, "'Should we not steal this pig from him to-night?' quoth Bruno to Buffalmaco. "'Could we so?' returned Buffalmaco. "'How?' "'Why, as to that,' rejoined Bruno, "'I have already marked how it may be done.' if he bestow not the pig elsewhere. So be it, then, said Buffalmaco. We will steal it, and then, perchance, our good host, Master Priest, will join us in doing honour to such a good cheer. That right gladly will I, quoth the priest. Whereupon? Some address, though, quoth Bruno, will be needful. Thou knowest, Buffalmaco, what a niggardly fellow Calandrino is, and how greedily he drinks at other folk's expense. Go we, therefore, and take him to the tavern, and there let the priest make as if, to do us honour, he would play the whole score, 
and suffer Calandrino to pay never a soldo, and he will grow tipsy, and then we shall speed excellent well, because he is alone in the house. As Bruno proposed, so they did, and Calandrino, finding that the priest would not suffer him to pay, drank a main, and took a great deal more aboard than he had need of, and the night being far spent, when he left the tavern, he dispensed with supper, and went home, and, thinking to have shut the door, got him to bed, leaving it open. Buffalmaco and Bruno went to sup with the priest, and after supper, taking with them certain implements with which to enter Calandrino's house, where Bruno thought it most feasible, they stealthily approached it, but finding the door open, they entered, and took down the pig, and carried it away to the priest's house, and having there bestowed it safely, went to bed. In the morning, when Calandrino, his head at length quit of the fumes of the wine, got up, and came downstairs, and found that his pig was nowhere to be seen, and that the door was open, he asked this, that, and the other man, whether they wist who had taken the pig away, and getting no answer, he began to make a great outcry. Alas, alas, luckless man that I am, that my pig should have been stolen from me. Meanwhile, Bulno and Buffalmaco, being also risen, made up to him, to hear what he would say touching the pig, whom he no sooner saw, than while nigh weeping he called them, saying, Alas, my friends, my pig is stolen from me. Bruno stepped up to him, and said in a low tone, "'Tis passing strange if thou art in the right for once. Alas, returned Calandrino, what I say is but too true. Why, then, out with it, man, quoth Bruno, cry aloud, that all folk may know that tis so. Calandrino then raised his voice, and said, "'By the body of God, I say of a truth that my pig has been stolen from me.' "'So,' quoth Bruno, "'but publish it, man, publish it, lift thy voice, make thyself well heard, that all may believe thy report. "'Thou art enough to make me give my soul to the enemy,' replied Calandrino. "'I say, dost not believe me, that hang me by the neck if the pig is not stolen from me.' Nay, but, quoth Bruno, how can it be? I saw it here but yesterday. Dost think to make me believe that it has taken to itself wings and flown away? All the same, tis as I tell thee, returned Calandrino. Is it possible? quoth Bruno. Ay, indeed, replied Calandrino. Tis even so, and I am undone, and know not how to go home. Never will my wife believe me, or, if she do so, I shall know no peace this year. Upon my hope of salvation, quoth Bruno, tis indeed a bad business. If so, it really is. But thou knowest, Calandrino, that was but yesterday I counselled thee to make believe that twas so. I should be sorry to think thou didst before thy wife and us at the same time. Oh, vociferated Calandrino, wilt thou drive me to despair, and provoke me to blaspheme God and the saints, and all the company of heaven, I tell thee that the pig has been stolen from me in the night. Whereupon? If so it be, quoth Buffalmaco, we must find a way, if we can, to recover it. Find a way? said Calandrino. How can we compass that? Why, replied Buffalmaco, tis certain that no one has come from India to steal thy pig. It must have been one of thy neighbours, and if thou couldst bring them together, I warrant thee, I know how to make thee assay with bread and cheese, and we will find out in a trice who has had the pig. I, struck in Bruno, make thy assay with bread and cheese in the presence of these gentry hereabout, one of whom I am sure has had the pig. Why, the thing would be seen through, and they would not come. What shall we do, then? said Buffalmaco. Where to? Bruno made answer. It must be done with good pills of ginger and good vernaccia, and they must be bidden come drink with us. They will suspect nothing, and will come, and pills of ginger can be blessed just as well as bread and cheese. Beyond a doubt, thou art right, quoth Buffalmaco, and thou, Calandrino, what sayst thou? Shall we do as Bruno says? Nay, I entreat you, for the love of God, quoth Calandrino, 
do even so, for I knew but who had had the pig. I should feel myself half consoled for my loss. Go to now, quoth Bruno, I am willing to do thy errand to Florence for these commodities, if thou givest me the money. Calandrino had some forty soldi upon him, which he gave to Bruno, who thereupon hied him to Florence to a friend of his that was an apothecary, and bought a pound of good peels of ginger, two of which, being of dog ginger, he caused to be compounded with fresh hepatic alloys, and then to be coated with sugar like the others, and lest they should be lost, or any of the others mistaken for them, he had a slight mark set upon them, by which he might readily recognize them. He also bought a flask of good vernaccia, and, thus laden, returned to the farm, and said to Calandrino, "'Tomorrow morning thou wilt bid those whom thou suspectest to come hither to drink with thee. As twill be a saint's day, it will all come readily enough, and to-night I and Buffalmaco will say the incantation over the pills, which in the morning I will bring to thee here, and for our friendship's sake will administer them myself, and do and say all that needs to be said and done. So Calandrino did as Bruno advised, and on the morning a goodly company, as well of young men from Florence, that happened to be in the village, as of husbandmen, being assembled in front of the church around the elm, Bruno and Buffalmaco came, bearing a box containing the ginger and the flask of wine, and ranged the folk in a circle, whereupon, Gentlemen, said Bruno, this meet I tell you the reason why you are gathered here, that if oft unpleasant to you should befall, you may have no ground for complaint against me. Calandrino here was the night before last rub of a fine pig, and cannot discover who has had it, and for that it must have been stolen by some one of us here. He would have each of you take and eat one of these pills, and drink of this vernaccia. Wherefore, I forthwith do you wit, that whose has had the pig will not be able to swallow the pill, but find it more bitter than poison, and will spit it out, and so, rather than he should suffer this shame in presence of so many, twere perhaps best that he that has had the pig should confess the fact to the priest, and I will wash my hands of the affair. All professed themselves ready enough to eat the pills, and so, having set them in a row with Calandrino among them, Bruno, beginning at one end, proceeded to give each a pill, and, when he came to Calandrino, he chose one of the pills of dog ginger, and put it in his hand. Calandrino thrust it forthwith between his teeth, and began to chew it. But no sooner was his tongue acquainted with the alloys, than, finding the bitterness intolerable, he spat it out. Now, the eyes of all the company being fixed on one another to see who should spit out his pill, Bruno, not having finished the distribution, feigned to be concerned with naught else, heard some one in his rear say, Ha, Calandrino, what means this? And at once turning round, and marking that Calandrino had spit out his pill, Wait a while, quoth he, perchance twas somewhat else that caused thee to spit. Take another. And thereupon, whipping out the other pill of dog ginger, he set it between Calandrino's teeth, and finished the distribution. Bitter as Calandrino had found the former pill, he found this tenfold more so. But being ashamed to spit it out, he kept it a while in his mouth, and chewed it, and as he did so, tears stood in his eyes that showed as large as filberts, and at length, being unable to bear it any longer, he spat it out, as he had its predecessor, which, being observed by Buffalmaco and Bruno, who were then administering the wine, and by all the company, twas averred by common consent that Calandrino had committed the theft himself, for which cause certain of them took him severely to task. However, the company being dispersed, and Bruno and Buffalmaco left alone with Calandrino, Buffalmaco began on this wise. I never doubted, but that thou hadst had it thyself, and wast minded to make us believe that it had been stolen from thee that we might not have of thee so much as a single drink, out of the price 
which thou gottest fright. Calandrino, with the bitterness of the alloys still on his tongue, fell as swearing that he had not had it. Whereupon, Nay, but comrade, quoth Buffalmaco, upon thy honour, what did it fetch? Six florins? Where to, Calandrino, being now on the verge of desperation, Bruno added, Now be reasonable, Calandrino, among the company that ate and drank with us, there was one that told me that thou hadst up there a girl that thou didst keep for thy pleasure, giving her what by hook or by crook thou couldst get together, and that he held it for certain that thou hadst sent her this pig, and thou art ground expert in this sort of cozenage. Thou tookest us one while adown the mugon, a gathering black stones, and having thus started us on a wild goose chase, thou madest off, and then wouldst fairn have us believe that thou hadst found the stone, and now, in like manner, thou thinkest by thine oaths to persuade us that this pig that thou hast given away or sold has been stolen from thee. But we know thy tricks of old, never another couldst thou play us, and to be round with thee the spell has cost us some trouble. Wherefore we mean that thou shalt give us pair of capons, or we will let Monatessa know all. Seeing that he was not believed, and deeming his mortification ample without the addition of his wife's resentment, Calandrino gave them the two pair of capons, with which, when the pig was salted, they returned to Florence, leaving Calandrino with the loss and the laugh against him. End of Day 8 The Sixth Story